Hi, welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to study Acts chapter 8. And since the Bible is a book of history and it's a Bible prophecy book, we're going to read Acts chapter 8 as if the pre-trib rapture bride is already gone and the believing portion of Israel have been grafted back into the church and are fulfilling their mandate as a nation to preach the gospel to all nations. So the raptured bride is going to be in her hidden form, ministering with Philip, an evangelist on earth, a Jewish evangelist, and he's going to be working miracles and ministering to the lost. And what we want you to see is that the bride is going to be working alongside Philip, but again, in her hidden form as the pre-trib raptured bride. So you don't see her, but she is bringing the power from heaven that Philip is using to minister with. We're going to notice in Acts chapter 7, because I'm going to set up the scene here, at the end of Acts chapter 7, Stephen was martyred. He and six other Christians were put in charge of feeding the widows. Stephen was the first martyr of the church. And it's interesting because now in Acts chapter 8 verse 1, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria. Verse 3, Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house and dragging off men and women. He would put them in prison. So see, that has happened before. It's going to happen again. Once the believing portion of Jews are being grafted into the church, there is going to be incredible persecution of the Jews by their own countrymen, starting with Jerusalem. And now we are going to see that the Christians are leaving Jerusalem. They have been scattered now the everywhere. The Holy Spirit wants us to take notice of Philip's ministry, what he does, where he goes, what he says, who he's ministering to. So verse 5, Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming Christ to them. Now, what is interesting, if you will remember, is the woman at the well who was raptured when she left her stone water pot. This is where Philip is going. He's going to the area of Samaria. So now, this is where we want to really start paying attention to what happens in Philip's life, what the miracles are like, how powerful they are, what's happening in the hearts of his listeners. Because what we're going to see is another aspect of the bride's ministry once she's in her fancy, eternal, glorified body. And we were talking about that in the last video. So we're going to carry on from here. Now, Philip's name means fond of horses. Yeah, it's made up of two Greek words, philo, which means deer, it means friend and neighbor, and hippos, which is a horse. So that is how we get his, the meaning of his name, fond of horses. So that's an interesting side note because that's going to come into play in just a little bit here. Verse 6. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. Because he was doing that same type of ministry in Jerusalem when feeding the widows. All kinds of miracles were happening while they were ministering. So now here's Philip in the area of Samaria. Same thing. He's doing what he knows to do. Verse 7, for in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice, and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Now here I want you to see the pre-trib raptured bride in her glorified body, and she is ministering in hidden form, so that when Philip is preaching the gospel, 
hearts are stirred. People are coming to the belief in Jesus Christ as Philip is laying hands on the sick and speaking commands to the demons and people to come out. The bride is going to supply the battery pack. She's the battery pack for all these miracles. She is bringing the presence of Jesus Christ with her onto the scene when the evangelists are ministering in faith. Verse 9, Now there was a man named Simon who formerly was practicing magic in the city and astonishing the people of Samaria, claiming to be someone great. And they all, from smallest to greatest, were giving attention to him, saying, This man is what is called the great power of God. Wow, that was some title he had, wasn't it? Well, you know, we're going to learn here that we want to be very careful that we are not flattered by titles that we are given by other men. Maybe titles at the office, titles in your ministry, uh, maybe you're given a title as a master gardener or your athletic group, whatever. But, you know, those titles can get us in a in bondage. We're going to see that in just a minute here. Verse 11, And they were giving him, Simon, attention because he had for a long time astonished them with his magic arts. So he was an entertainer. He was a celebrity. He was getting paid for his craft. Verse 12, But when they believed Philip preaching the good news, about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. So here was the person who used to amaze other people, now he's being amazed. Verse 14, Now when the apostles in Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent them Peter and John, who came down and prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. So take notice, and we could spend a whole other hour on this, that the people were being baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, yet they still needed the Holy Spirit. Things have not changed. It's so true for the church now. For he, the Holy Spirit, had not yet fallen on any of them, and they had simply been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then they began laying their hands on them, and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. Verse 18, Now when Simon saw that the Spirit was bestowed through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this authority as well, so that everyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Okay, now there's some things that I want to commend Simon for. He believed that Jesus Christ was God, to the point where he was following Philip around. That's great. Um, He comprehended that it required authority to be able to lay hands on people and have them receive the Holy Spirit as well. Um, I commend him because it looks like he wanted to help other people, just like Philip was helping people and Peter and John were helping other people. Okay, so he's a. there's many attributes about this new convert who allowed himself to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. There's many great attributes. I mean, people would think this is an all-around great guy. But we can see that by his request, And by Peter's response, he wasn't all that innocent. He had some things to learn. It is giving the appearance that he wanted to split off from Peter, Philip, and John and start his own mega ministry. After all, he's used to being in the limelight. Uh, He knows how to build an organization. He knows to gather how to gather a crowd. Well, now he's got even more skills to do it with, right? So he's thinking if he can have this authority to lay hands on people and have them receive the power of God, well, this just enhances his career. Well, he didn't want to be accountable to a church body that wasn't profitable. He was used to a much more affluent lifestyle, and he didn't want to be like those old 
poor church folk. So Peter, in verse 20, said to him, May your silver perish with you, because you thought you could obtain the gift of God with money. Peter then says something really big. He says, in verse 21, you have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Well, that's an interesting thing. What did we learn about in the previous video? When Jesus wanted to wash Peter's feet. And Peter says, you're, you're never going to wash my feet. You're too good for that, is what he was saying. And remember what Jesus said to him in John 13, 8. Jesus said, if I do not wash you, you have no part with me. Well, now here, this is on the forefront of Peter's mind because he's saying this to Simon in Acts chapter 8, verse 21. He says, you have no part or portion in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. So you see, that statement that Jesus made had huge impact on Peter. And I'm thinking, oh my goodness, this should have huge impact on every believer, especially believers in ministry. Peter goes on to say in verse 22, Therefore, repent of this wickedness of yours and pray the Lord that, if possible, the intention of your heart may be forgiven you. So, you know, we have to ask the Lord to reveal the intentions of our heart because our heart will fool us. We think we have a good heart. <laughs> well, the Bible certainly tells us differently in Jeremiah, doesn't it? So we need to pray over our heart and ask the Lord to show us what our true intentions are, what our motives are, because we don't really know what they are. They trick us. Verse 23, Peter goes on to say, For I see that you are in the gall of bitterness and in the bondage of iniquity. So, you know, Simon, he did not want to have to travel with the church. He wanted to spring off and go do his own thing and have the same power of God, the same results, but not have any accountability. He wanted to be a lone ranger. That's what he was used to. Let's see how Simon responds in verse 24. So Simon answered and said, Pray to the Lord for me yourselves, so that nothing of what you have said may come upon me. All right, well, what was Simon talking about? Obviously, Philip, Peter, and John had been talking about the wrath of God, the fire of God, things that happen to those who don't believe. So this is why Simon is saying, pray that that doesn't happen to me. So he recognizes he needs to be prayed for. Not a bad thing, right? However, with what Peter said to him, this was Simon's opportunity to say, will you pray with me? Help me, help me. To humble himself and pray for himself. And I know the apostles would have joined in and prayed with him. But we don't see that happening. Moving on, let's look at verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem. So this is referring to Peter and John. And they were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samaritans. Verse 26. But an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying... Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Now, this is a desert road, we're told. All right, this is big because now we're seeing another ministry of the raptured bride who's ministering in hidden form to the left behind church, to the Jews who are coming into belief and beginning to evangelize to Jews and Gentiles alike. So we see an angel of the Lord. You know, Luke chapter 20, verse 36, Jesus says, in the resurrection, so those who have fancy glorified bodies, they are like angels being the sons of God. So what this tells us is when we're raptured and our loved ones are resurrected, we're going to be like 
angels. So this is why it's important and why I have been saying in our videos to read what the angels do. What does their ministry look like? How long do they stay in a place? What are they dressed in? What do they say? Do they linger? Do they do other activities? And I've mentioned when you see a miracle that occurs, understand that there are spirits that are bringing the power of God onto the scene, working through the evangelist's faith. So here we see an angel of the Lord speaking to Philip. Now, notice something else here in verse 26, that this, God was wanting Philip to go to Gaza. Well, Gaza has been in the news a lot recently, hasn't it? Look at verse 27 now. Just keep that tucked in your pocket. Verse 27, so he got up and went, and there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure, and he had come to Jerusalem to worship. Okay, so this eunuch is basically an administrator for a very powerful ruler, Ethiopian ruler, uh, maybe even a ruler that's in the beast system. And we see this Ethiopian eunuch, he had been in Jerusalem worshiping God. So now we know, oh, by this time, the third temple will have been built in Jerusalem. Hmm. And we're seeing that he's coming from Jerusalem, going to Gaza. Huh. Does this indicate that this scuffle that's going on in Gaza, is Israel going to win that war? Are they going to actually push Hamas out? Are they going to resettle the Ethiopian community that's in Israel in that area? Because you know, the Ethiopian Jews are being made to feel like second class citizens even though they are Jewish. The native Jews are not treating them with very much respect. And I had Angeline dig up some information for us. It was very interesting. Currently, Israel is home to the largest Beta Israel community in the world with about 164,000 citizens of Ethiopian descent who are mainly assembled in the smaller urban areas of central Israel. Well, you know, they observe the Torah just a little bit different than the Orthodox Jews. Did you know that the Ethiopian Jews, they don't observe Purim? Because they had, those Jews had gotten out of Israel when the Assyrians were coming to the northern ten tribes. So many of those from those Jewish ten tribes, they relocated down to the southern part of Israel to be preserved. Many of those ten tribes just left the area altogether and went to other nations. Many went to Ethiopia. So over the last you know, decade or so, those Ethiopian Jews have been coming back to Israel. And the population is growing. And, you know, Israel does not have all that much land. And so they're having to find places to put all these people. Could it be? I don't know. Are we getting an indication that by the time we get to Acts chapter 8, when the first Orthodox Jews kill the first Jewish Christian that's been grafted into the church, and a great persecution breaks out, is that when we're seeing the Ethiopians all settled in the Gaza area? I don't know. I'm just looking at this and percolating on ideas. You might see something different, so you can let us know. Maybe you've got some insight on that. Okay, I've got to quickly get through this. Verse 29, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join his chariot. So, in a moment, we're going to notice that the chariot was moving. So here's Philip. In verse 30, he ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? So I want you to get the scene here. Step into the scene, as I often say. 
there's a moving chariot with a eunuch in it. He's a passenger. He's got a driver because he's a fancy schmancy official for a bigger fancy schmancy official ruler. And so he's got somebody that's driving this chariot. And so he's sitting as, in a pass, as a passenger and he's reading. And so Philip runs next to He's keeping up with the horses. Interesting. Remember what his name is? Fond of horses. Ah, this is so fun. Okay, so Philip runs up and he, he isn't even out of breath. He says, do you understand what you're reading? Verse 31, and he, the eunuch says, well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. So, you know, that's kind of, I don't know, was that like a moving train and somebody tries to load onto a train or we don't see the eunuch stopping the chariot? Uh, this is just so fascinating to me. Verse 32, now the passage of scripture which he was reading was this. He was led as a sheep to slaughter and as a lamb before its shearer is silent. So he does not open his mouth. Well, we know this passage is from Isaiah 53. And the Jewish rabbis have always called it the forbidden chapter. Yeah, the Jewish rabbis do not let Jews read Isaiah 53. They say, oh, that's not for you. No one can understand it. So many Jews have never read that chapter out of Isaiah. So here's this Ethiopian Jewish eunuch reading that passage. Oh my goodness. Oh, it goes on to say in verse 33, in humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. Verse 34, the eunuch answered Philip and said, please tell me of whom does this prophet say this? Of himself or of someone else? Then Philip opened his mouth and beginning from this scripture, he preached Jesus to him. Verse 36, as they went along the road, they came to some water and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip said, if you believe with all of your heart, you may. And he, the eunuch answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God. Okay, so that's just entry level Christianity. And now this eunuch is gonna be baptized in just a moment here. See, I wish I could go on and on about that. There's so much here, but. Verse 38, and he ordered the chariot to stop. Ah, this is how we know the chariot has been moving this whole time. And we're finally told when the eunuch orders the driver to stop the chariot. They both went down into the water, Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away, and the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and as he passed through, he kept preaching the gospel to all the cities until he came to Caesarea. All right, let me give a closing commentary here. Philip, whose name means fond of horses, He's told, go catch up with that chariot and talk to that eunuch. So he's running. Oh, I think the, I think the pre-trib raptured bride in hidden form was on her white horse, picked up Philip, I don't know, maybe by the ear, by the nape of a neck and just kind of helped him along, helped him keep up, keep up with the eunuch's horses. So he wasn't even out of breath and could have this conversation, gets on the chariot, has a conversation with the eunuch. They stop the chariot. They go into the water to be baptized. They both go under. <laughs> and when they come up, the bride, the hidden bride ministers to Philip by, I don't know, putting him on her horse. They enter another dimension and Philip is dropped off at Azotus. All right? Are you seeing some of the amazing ministry that the pre-trib raptured bride is going to get to do to help 
minister to the Left Behind Church, to help them fulfill the Great Commission, to help them bring in the Great White Harvest. She is going to be the battery pack. She is going to be giving instructions to the Left Behind Church and the new converts coming into the church. This is why John the Baptist says, Jesus is going to increase. <laughs> I'm going to decrease. He, John the Baptist knew he was going to be killed. So just keep studying the New Testament like this, and you are going to find more and more fascinating details about what your ministry is going to be like as the pre-trib raptured bride. Because no, the minute you get raptured, you are not going to find yourself in a church at the beginning of an aisle, seeing Jesus at the end of the aisle, walking up, getting married, and going off on a seven-year honeymoon. That is not in the Bible. So nobody watching this video better tell me that what I'm teaching is not in the Bible. Because what they've been taught in their churches is not in the Bible. It's not even the heart of the Father to leave the left behind church and the Jews struggling during a terrible time in world history with no help. I mean, that's the whole purpose for equipping the bride, for giving her a glorified body that can, that can do amazing feats and do the greater works. It's so that she can do the greater works to minister to others. <laughs> okay, I know you guys are getting it. And I just love that you're letting me know this because this really, it does give me the courage to keep pressing in and telling you more and more things about what our Bible prophecy team has been discovering. And I will tell you, it does take courage because we feel like we're kind of swimming against the Christian culture by revealing these deep truths. But you guys are helping us and cheering us on and encouraging us. And we want to reciprocate. We want to cheer you on and we want to encourage you as well. So thank you for watching all the way to the end of the video. And I will talk to you later. Bye. Mm -hmm.